Hi again, everybody, and welcome to Inside Golf. I'm Harry Donahue. Coming up on today's show, we'll introduce you to a man who spent 17 years as a college basketball head coach, including nine at Villanova University. He won a Big East regular season championship. He won the Big East tournament. At one time during his career, he was ranked number two in the nation. Now he's moved on to doing college basketball for CBS television, and he loves the game of golf. Coming up, we'll meet Steve Lapis next on Inside Golf. Inside Golf is presented by Destination Monco Golf. 54 courses, 300,000 yards. Check them out at montcogolf.com. Buy the first tee of Philadelphia. The first tee helps young men and women become better golfers, but most important, better people. Get involved. Visit thefirstteephiladelphia.org. Buy the Golf Association of Philadelphia, GAP, celebrating amateur golf since 1897. Buy Jersey Man Magazine. It's a Jersey way of life. And by Philly Man Magazine, bringing it to Broad Street. By the Haverford Trust Company. Quality is in our DNA. And by Inside Golf's partner since 1998, the Philadelphia Section PGA. Experts in the game and business of golf. Take time to thank your local PGA golf professional. Golf has always provided the health benefits of fresh air, focus, and fun. Now let's apply social distancing to the game we love. Stay home if sick and always stay six feet apart and avoid large gatherings on the course. Try thumbs up, or fist pumps, not handshakes or fist bumps. When in doubt, just don't touch and wash your hands. Mark your ball clearly and wear a cloth facial covering when taking a lesson. Finally, respect your fellow golfers and let's be grateful for every swing. Welcome back, Inside Golf continues. We are at Overbrook Golf Club with Steve Lapis. Lap, always a pleasure, especially when we're talking golf. We'll talk a little basketball as well. How you doing? I'm doing great. My home away from home, really, here. Uh, I know, <laughs> I know. I should talk to your wife about that. Uh, Steve Lapis, folks, in my due diligence of preparing for this little interview, I looked it up, 280. Division one wins as a head coach in 17 years as a head coach in three schools. Manhattan, where he grew up in New York City. Villanova, of course, for nine years. Finished up at UMass and seven postseason tournaments as head coach of the Wildcats. He won a NIT championship in 1994 with Villanova's all-time leading scorer, Curry Kittles. And the list goes on and on and on. You told me uh, this year we were sitting around someplace where Steve does basketball for CBS. And told me about how you got Curry Kittles to come to Villanova. You had just taken over the job and you thought maybe you were going to lose him. First of all, Harry, the, the crazy thing is I didn't know how good he was. I'd never seen him in high school. I was at Manhattan. We weren't recruiting that level, obviously. So I didn't even know who he was. But I knew we had three kids signed. We got to try and salvage him. And he didn't want to come. And I couldn't blame him. He, had, he was going to go play for Coach Massimino. And he says, who's this guy, Steve Lapis? I don't even know who he is. He didn't want to come. Kid was from New Orleans. First thing I do when I get the job, I go down there to talk to him. The first two hours of the meeting, his parents were great, and his coach, Bernard Griffith. He didn't even look at me. Wow. I was sitting there like this. Not a he's, good he's sign. He's sitting in your seat, and he's looking there. And I'm like going crazy the way I am, trying to convince him. Finally, after about two hours, I got him looking at me. And now we're feeling a little better. He's responding. So I, now it was like 10, 30, 11 o'clock. Time to leave. So I get up, I leave, I'm feeling pretty good. I go outside, the news pe the people from New Orleans are outside because it's kind of a big story down there. What's Kerry Kittles gonna do? So they tell me, they say, what do you, well, coach, what do you think? I said, I think everything's gonna be fine. I think he's gonna come to Villanova. I think it's gonna be okay. I go back to my room at the hotel. I turn on the 11 o'clock news. I see myself. They interview Kerry right after. He says, no way I'm going to Villanova. <laughs> I said, oh my God. I had to come back here to do something. I went back two days later, right. and we were able to work it out where he was going to give it a try. And uh, worked out pretty good for Kerry Kittles and for Villanova. Worked out really good for uh, both you guys. He was a four-year player. As I said, he's still the number one all-time scorer in Villanova basketball history. Still close to you, I assume. Very close. And he know? plays a lot of golf. Plays a lot of golf, <laughs> has five kids, lives in North Jersey. 
uh, got it, went back to Villanova, got his MBA. I mean, this is his, he was a special kid. This kid as a junior in college could have left and been top 10. Would have probably he, today. Oh, would, absolutely, would have gone yeah, probably. Right. I mean, in those days, but I mean, he could have left and been a top 10 pick. Instead, he stayed. He was the seventh pick in the draft his senior year. But I mean, he was a special kid. He loved Villanova. He loved everything about it. And that's, well, I talk all the time about kids now with all this transferring stuff. Here's a kid who didn't want to come with the coaching change. Even his freshman year was rocky. He wasn't sure he liked it. He was from New Orleans. He came up to Philadelphia. He stuck it out. And let me tell you something, there is no more proud Villanovan today than Gary Keel. He loves Villanova, and he loves everything Villanova did for him, and he did for Villanova. So it's a lesson in don't always pick up and say, hey, that's it. I'm out. I'm leaving. I don't like this. The coach <laughs> took me out of the game. He stuck through it, and he's as happy as could be for it. Well, that's some story. You had to go right back to New Orleans and uh, kind of make sure that, hey, Kerry, Villanova's the right place for you. Uh, your second year at Villanova, 20 and 12, First 20 win season for the Wildcats in four years prior to that, 1988. And uh, 1995, 25 and 8, school record at the time, 14 Big East Conference wins. I mean, this is when the Big East had Karnaseka, Bayheim, John Thompson. I mean, uh, that was heavy duty stuff. Yeah, I mean, it was a very proud. I mean, to think to grow up in New York City and you want to be a coach and you were a division, you were a pep half of a Division Three player yourself, and uh, you get an opportunity to coach in the best league in the country against Hall of Fame coaches. I mean, Lou Karnasek, John Thompson, I was Roley Massimino's assistant, who should be in the Hall of Fame, by the way, but that's a story for another day. Uh, you know, Jim Beheim, Jim Calhoun. So to have a chance to coach, you know, P.J. Carlissimo was there then, Rick Barnes was there then. Think about sure. the people that were in that wow. league in Rick those Barnes days. was like a rookie, he was yeah, like you. like me. And he'd been there a couple of years. So, you know, to have an opportunity to coach at a school like Villanova, one of the great basketball programs in the history of college basketball, and then to be the head coach in the Big East on top of it, it was really like a dream come true. Well, the dream did come true a little bit in 96. 26 and seven, that's the most at the time wins for a Villanova team in a season. 26 victories, you were ranked, I think, uh, number two in the nation. You went to Hawaii, you won a tournament there, and went number two in December, huh? Yeah, we beat North Carolina in the Maui Classic <laughs> in the championship game. They had Vince Carter, uh, Anton, Dean, Dean Smith, Dean Smith, Anton Jameson. We actually played North Carolina that year twice. Wow. We beat them twice that year. And uh, ironically, not that, you, not that many teams got a chance to play Carolina twice in the same season unless you played them in an NCAA tournament or something. So we, put, we had a game scheduled, and just so happened we played them in the championship game in Maui. And I don't know, if, to beat North Carolina twice in the same year outside the league didn't happen very often. So we were very proud of that. It was a great game. We played in the Spectrum, actually. Wow. And we beat them by like 20, 25 points. It was a great game. I remember that very, very vividly. It was a noon game on CBS. So um, a lot of great memories. A lot of great memories. Speaking of CBS, uh, for the last how many years now you've been with uh, CBS doing college basketball? I've been there. 50, this is going to be my 16th year this wow. year coming up. Uh, so it's been a long time, no doubt. You know, and uh, I kind of fell into it. Didn't know what I wanted to do. I wanted to do something after UMass. I was going to get back into coaching. Actually, was my plan. But I wanted to do something in the maybe for a year or two in the meantime, and started into the TV. I really loved it, and you know, CBS. Uh, the big thing was I started CSTV and uh, CBS bought CSTV and that was a big break for me and uh, I, I, they've been great to me uh, I love what I do now and uh, I miss coaching there's no doubt you know I miss the players and this year because of the virus you missed the tournament like everybody else did you were ready to go huge miss right? obviously for everybody a couple that first weekend but uh, hey you know you'll you'll get another shot I yeah know. I'm looking forward to it just hopefully everything goes well this year all right, stay with us. We talked uh, a little bit about being here at Overbrook because this is where Steve likes to play a little bit of golf. So we're going to see what kind of game the coach has. That's next. Steve Lapis at Inside Golf on the tee. Stay with us. I feel bad for these workers out there right now. That's all right. We can holler for it.
Welcome back. Inside Golf continues with Steve Lapis. We are at Overbrook Golf Club. And Steve, before we see a little bit of your game on display here, I think this is the par 3 tenth. A uh, little bit of a history lesson. When was the first time, if you remember, you picked up a golf club? I was an assistant. I grew up in New York City. Right. And the only thing you had golf clubs for back then was protection. You didn't <laughs> play golf in New York when you grow up. And uh, so I was an assistant here in 1984, and I went with Coach Massimino uh, in the area here to play golf. And the one thing I do remember was after the round, he said, do yourself a favor. I said, what's that, Coach? He said, break your clubs. Oh, how about <laughs> it was, that? It was a rough day. There's no doubt about it. So that was my first uh, golfing experience. When did you really get into it, though? Uh, you know, I, I kind of loved it from the beginning. And uh, he used to take me uh, with this round here, Radnor Valley Golf Club. He used to take me there. He was a member there. And he used to take me there a lot, and uh, I really got into it. And then my friends and my brother, they all got into it. It just so seems at the same time. They weren't living around here. They were living up in the New York suburbs. Sure. And they got into it, so we all kind of did together. Then we started doing golf trips every year, and it became a passion. And it's obviously a passion for me now. You're a lifer. All right. It's a passion for him now, and we're now we're going to see... Uh why it is such a big part of your life. Huh? That's a problem now. All right, we got, what do we got, about 160 yards? You got 160 yard, par three. It's the 18 handicap hole. Today, the good thing is, no wind. No Makes wind. it a little bit better, but still, I, I have no idea what I'm gonna do. You know, when you're a 20 handicap, you never know what's gonna happen. Okay, I wasn't gonna ask you your handicap. <laughs> Thanks for volunteering Well, that. what the heck. Full disclosure <laughs> from the coach. All right, put the peg in the ground. I'm gonna move over here. You ever get out with Bill Raftery? I have. Another CBS guy. Raffle, he's got the passion for the I, game. I played with Raff about, you know what? We used to have the Big East meetings at TPC Sawgrass. Oh. And we used to, and I played with him there a couple of times. He was at the meeting. Not because not when he was coaching, when he was broadcast. Right. Yeah. I've uh, I feel bad for these workers out there right now. That's all right, we can holler for. Him. How about a hole in one? Just give me a piece. I didn't see it. I didn't see it bouncing. Did you go over that hill? It might be on the bunk. Might be in you the bunk. You know what? If we didn't see it, Try we, to... we're going to go down and put it on there. All that right. was a good shot. Uh, it wasn't <laughs> bad. All right, Steve, let's uh, get a deuce here. Little downhill. Left to right. Does he have it? You know what? I'll be generous. I'm even going to give it to you. Oh, thank okay? you. I appreciate what do you think? that. You can make that's, that. That's because right? we're not betting, right? Oh my goodness. <laughs> well, you don't want me to have to, you know, use no, this No, you got the lever. No, don't worry about that. That's good, <laughs> as they you. say. That's good. Well, that's great. I mean, now you're going to go out later today, play around with some of your friends, a little action maybe. On the, they would even give you that putt. No, they give me that. Yes. Yeah? They don't give me much outside of that. But there's not a lot of gimmies in that game, let me I tell know. you. Is this the best part of the game, uh, the, the camaraderie? I mean, playing with, the, you know, maybe eight to ten guys on a regular basis. My wife jokes with me all the time, Harry. When I grew up, I grew up in New York City, as I said, and I used to play basketball every day from when I was 12 years old till I was Morning, noon, and night. That's all we did. We played in the park, Fort Tryon Park, every day. And my wife says to me, says, you know, it's interesting. When you were 14, 15, 16, 17, you played basketball in the park every day. Now you go to the park every day and you play golf and you're 66. I said, you know what, come to think of it, that is probably, that is true. So, uh, well, you don't want to be running up and down at that park <laughs> playing basketball. No, that's for sure. Guys our age, I mean, what else you got to do? It's, Tennis, maybe? It's great. The competition, the camaraderie, you get fired up. Not that we bet a lot or whatever, but it just gets your blood going a little bit. So uh, we, we have a lot of fun and I play here. I also play Great Bay in the summertime, sure. another course in the area. Uh, when we're down the shore. So, uh, yeah, I love it. It's a great game. Great game indeed. All right, stay with us. When we come back, we'll have our tee off panel. That's next America on Inside Doesn't Game. have a, an individual they can go to to say, can we do this or can we not do that? Welcome back to Inside Golf Now it continues. It's time for our virtual tee off as uh, we are joined by Three gentlemen who have been uh, rather frequent contributors to Inside Golf over the years. Quint Spitzer is the president of the Golf Association of Philadelphia. How are you doing today, Quint? I'm fine, Harry. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Joe Logan, MyPhillyGolf.com. Hardly needs an introduction. Hi, Joe. Hi. Good to be here. Thanks. 
And back with us again for this segment of Teed Off from the Philadelphia section of the PGA of America, Director of Communications, Matt Fry. Hi, Matt. Hi, Harry. Thanks for having me. Matt, this is a Ryder Cup, we think. They're supposed to play it in, uh, what, September out at Whistling Straits. So far, though, I don't think the PGA of America has uh, given the green light. A lot of things are being discussed. Uh, one of the things being maybe no fans. And some players have uh, expressed their opinion. And maybe if there's no fans, there should be no Ryder Cup. And they should take a gap year and move it to next year. What, uh, what's on your mind when it comes to yes or no Ryder Cup this year, even with fans or no Ryder Cup if they can't have it? Well, if there are no fans, it will certainly be a lot different than what we've come to expect in the past 25, 30 years of the Ryder Cup. Uh, however, it would still be live golf. It would still mean something. It would still be fun to watch on television. It would just not be quite what we're expecting. Uh, I would hope that they can get fans in, in uh, by the time it's scheduled for, but I certainly wouldn't want if there's any type of risk involved. So if, if the, the local government saying it's, it's still not safe enough, I, I would err on the side of caution. Quinn, I think uh, you can add to our discussion here on this whole issue some information about what is being thought about in terms of maybe holding off for a year or so. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of effort to move the golf tournament, and there's several reasons for that. First of all, let's remember that Wisconsin is the wild, wild Midwest these days. With the Supreme Court ruling there, there actually are no rules. So the PGA of America doesn't have a, an individual they can go to to say, can we do this or can we not do that? Second problem is the event itself is, is highly congested. There are more people concentrated among smaller spaces than a typical golf tournament. And, and, and with the exception of the 17th hole at the Waste Management, there's no other event in all of golf that's truly a spectator event. It's not the same without spectators there. So the idea of being able to push it into next year, assuming they can find a spot that's amenable on the calendar to the PGA Tour, is probably the best option. And I'm sure those discussions are ongoing. Joe, uh, as I mentioned earlier in the introduction, some players have already voiced their opinions on this. Rory McIlroy is uh, probably the biggest name that has, and he's not a proponent of having the Ryder Cup this year if there won't be any fans. My initial reaction to that, and I'd like you to chime in to see if I'm on target or not, is that I, I get it. Like Quinn said, Outside of the waste management of part three there, there's number 16. There's no other event like it in golf when they go out there and tee off on the first hole, first day of the Ryder Cup. But to me, I, even though fans are so important and it means so much to players to play in front of thousands, the game of golf, I think, needs, especially coming out of what we're going through in, around the world, needs an event like this, even if it means just watching and going on TV. I mean, the players have to realize there's more to it than that. I mean, golf, this would still be a major center stage event. Am I wrong? I think it would. I'm, I think I'm a little different from that in that I, I see the Ryder Cup as different from other regular PGA Tour events or anything like that. Bear in mind, the, the British Open, the Open Championship, was canceled for this year. But the, the Ryder Cup is such a deliberately partisan event with fans on both sides cheering. I think without that, it would be missing something. Uh, and also, let me point out that Whistling Straits, there are issues that are unique to Whistling Straits. It is such a difficult course for fans. Uh, I remember covering the PGA there in about 2004 or whatever it was and and between the holes there these big sand mounds it's the only major championship I've ever been to where they were helicoptering people out with broken ankles and arms every day all day and it's the only tournament I've ever been to where they issued a daily injury report for fans so <laughs> that's what whistling straights is but but uh, you know they're not going to do what I want them to do. So, uh, well, Matt, probably one of the more uh, significant events in the history of the competition, Ryder Cup or otherwise, uh, was Dustin Johnson at Whistling Straits with all the fans walking through the bunkers and 
you know, he wasn't sure if it was a waste area or bunker, even though there were signs all over the locker room and everything. They wouldn't have that problem, right? No, they, they certainly wouldn't. But they'd also have more rules officials since it's a much smaller field for the Ryder Cup than it is the PGA Championship. Yeah, yeah. Well, Matt, what's your tip? My reaction about how the game is bigger than just a live audience. Am I right about that, or would you see it differently? I think so. I I I think the golfing public as a whole would love to see the Ryder Cup, whether it have fans or not. Obviously, most people are going to want fans, but they'd still like live golf. The, the other part that comes into the equation is the business side. Obviously, if there's less fans, there's less money to be made, less partner exposure, et cetera. And I think that's where a lot of the hang-up might come from. Quinn, it would be a crowded fall schedule, wouldn't it? Ryder Cup, U.S. Open, Masters in the fall. Can you imagine what the golf season – you know, that used to be, you know, the, uh, the fun time of the year when they had all these crazy events waiting for January to roll around. That certainly would be some fall schedule. For the embarrassment of riches, there will be a lot of good golf to watch. It, it's going to be different. I think we have to get accustomed to that. But uh, it's one of those things where if you can go ahead and have the big events, even if you have to wedge them all together, you know, we love to see them. There's too much tradition. They all go back 100 years or, or somewhat like that. And, and we want to see them as often as we can. So uh, it'll be a very, very full fall, but it'll be a lot of fun. Well, gentlemen, let's see what happens. Let's see if I take our advice or not. Quinn, Matt, Joe, thanks for joining us. And we'll be back. More to come on Inside Golf in a moment. Golf's unique because it's filled with tradition, history, and honesty. A golf course is like a brand new landscape every time you get to go out there. Golf is one of the only opportunities that we have these days where you get uninterrupted chunk of time to spend with, with people. Montgomery County is an awesome place for golf. First of all, there's over 50 golf courses and there's golf courses of all types here. There are over 300,000 yards of golf in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. Northwest of Montgomery County is different because on our course here, there's 144 feet of elevation change. It's a big golf course, 7,500 yards from the tips, a newer style course. We have our Greens Committee. They are players who have literally played here for 20 years at least. So if you're really good at golf, you can get out there and play on some of the most historic and fantastic courses out there, but then there's also medium level courses. There's only a few times where pros get invited to your golf course, so that's a big deal. When you look at the elite players, the icons, the legends of golf, they always came to this part of the Northeast to play golf. When you get to take guests around and they get to see the plaque and realize the history of what's happened here, it really is a special place for guests and our members knowing that they had such history here. The people are so welcome and inviting. They love to participate in all of our events. They love the game. They love to be outside. A bad day on the golf course is always better than a good day at work. <laughs> you have an amazing platform of premier country clubs in this area, and they're not far away. It is a destination golf course county because there are so many golf courses per square mile. You could play three rounds of golf on a long summer day in that area and drive less than six miles. All main arteries connect to Montgomery County. We own golf. Welcome back to Inside Golf. Chatting with Steve Lapis to wrap things up. Steve, you enjoy golf. You enjoy doing games on CBS. How much, though, do you miss coaching? Well, I miss it a lot. You know, there's no doubt. I miss it probably less now than I did when I first got out. But, you know, I miss the players. You know, people ask, what do you miss? I miss the players. I miss the coaches. You Being part of a team, because I always was my whole life on a team. But you know what I really, and, and, and also with that, you cannot, the feeling of a win on the road, you cannot get that feeling. When you go in that locker room after you win a game on the road with your players, that feeling cannot be replicated anywhere, anytime. I miss that feeling of accomplishing something with a group. Right, and winning on the road, especially in a 
conference like the Big East, like you did, winning the regular season title, winning the tournament in Madison Square Garden, your hometown, that must have been really special. Yeah, I mean, I have a picture in my basement cutting the net down in Madison Square Garden. I mean, so, I mean, I cut down two nets in Madison Square Garden when we won the NIT championship and then when we won the Big East tournament the, the following year. So, I mean, a lot of great, unbelievable memories. I've been very lucky, very blessed. Uh, you know, the, big, the t thing I tell my kids, I said, the luckiest thing about what I, what's happened to me is for 40 years, including this day, I worked hard, but I never felt like I worked a day in my life because I always was able to do work in my passion. And uh, that's a gift and a blessing right there. Well, your passion is expressed numerous ways. You know, in TV, they are always looking for people with energy. They didn't have to tell <laughs> Steve Lapis anything about energy. You have it, the energy, the passion, whether it's coaching or whether it's broadcasting or out on the golf course. It, you're a fun guy to be around. Thank you, Harry. I, I love playing with you. I want to get into your pocket one of these days soon. <laughs> oh, <though. laughs> well, it's probably easier now than ever. That's going to do it for this week's edition of Inside Golf. For the coach, Steve Lapis, I'm Harry Donahue. Remember, no matter how bad it's going for you out there, don't pick up. And we'll see you next time on Inside Golf. Inside Golf is presented by Destination Monco Golf. 54 courses, 300,000 yards. Check them out at montcogolf.com. Buy the first tee of Philadelphia. The first tee helps young men and women become better golfers, but most important, better people. Get involved. Visit thefirstteephiladelphia.org. Buy the Golf Association of Philadelphia, GAP. Celebrating amateur golf since 1897. By Jersey Man Magazine, it's a Jersey way of life. And by Philly Man Magazine, bringing it to Broad Street. By the Haverford Trust Company, quality is in our DNA. And by Inside Golf's partner since 1998, the Philadelphia Section PGA, experts in the game and business of golf. Take time to thank your local PGA golf professional.